think it's time to, to begin because the time is short and, and there are many things to, to talk today about this topic, so we can, we can begin. Um, uh, good morning to everyone. Um, um, it's a great pleasure for me to moderate this panel organized by San Pablo Theo University uh, based in Madrid and uh, South EU Google Data Government uh, Chair. Um, here with me uh, are three panelists and there's another one who will, will join us online. Uh, three of them are mm, members of the board of the South EU uh, Google Data Governance Chair and also the other one is a uh, member of the board is Juan Jose Luis Piñarmañas who is the, the professor in, in Ceu San Pablo uh, University. Uh, I, I am very happy to moderate all of them. I apologize uh, because Jose Luis Piña is not here. Uh, uh, and then I would like to, to begin with a little forward uh, and, and um, afterwards I, I could give the, 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 the floor to the, to the panelists. As uh, you may say, uh, at the beginning of this week, uh, there was announced a um, decision of the Irish DPC um, uh, finding Meta with a very high, high amount, 1.1 billion euros. It is the highest amount of uh, data protection fine in Europe. But this is not the most important thing. The most important thing in that decision is that the supervisory authority uh, has ordered Meta to suspend the flow of data in five months. Of course, Meta is going to appeal, but uh, if they don't get an order to stay, uh, uh, the supervisor order, they would suspend the flow of data in five months. Of course, Meta is not the only one company who use the standard contract clauses to support the flow of data between EU and the US. There are many others. So the situation following the decision of the IRIS uh, Data Protection Commission um, f f determines that we need to find an answer on the data privacy framework between the for the, the transfers uh, from the EU to the US. And this is the topic of this panel. Uh, we have to uh, speak about this topic and to look uh, into, into the details of this topic uh, for excellent panelists. Uh, and um, we are going to have in the first place uh, Isabel Rocha, who is uh, the managing director of the, um, uh, the Office of the International Association of Privacy Professionals here in Brussels. And I, I, I would like to give her the floor uh, to tell us um, a general broad approach of the frame um, we are going to talk about. Isabel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for, for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. Um, so just a quick word indeed about the IAPP. Uh, we are a global organization, so we represent the privacy practitioners um, globally. Uh, and importantly, we are policy neutral. Um, so I will try to keep my, my personal opinions to myself. Um, but um, I, I also want to stress that uh, a lot of my, my remarks will reflect the fact that our organization, again, chiefly, is composed of, of practitioners, uh, not only, but um, uh, we, we tend to feed our, our uh, research, our, our analysis through the lens of uh, people who are deep into uh, privacy work daily, uh, being chief privacy officers, data protection officers, privacy managers, engineers, and, and so on. Um, so indeed, I, I, um, I thought I would 
set the scene a little bit for for the conversation um, in with a, a couple of uh, a couple of remarks. I think I mean the the starting point of, of today's conversation is is uh, uh, undoubtedly the Schrems two case from the Court of Justice, and uh, there were two main pieces to that um, to that ruling um, invalidating the the privacy shield at the time. Uh, one was really around uh, limitations to U.S. signal intelligence practices, and the terms necessity and proportionality here play a, an important role. Um, the other aspect was really around the redress mechanism um, and uh, arguing that the, the framework uh, at the time was not <coughs> meeting the essential equivalence test from the um, European um, Court of, of Justice. Um, so fast forward to, to today um, and, and the process that we find ourselves in with a, uh, a year-long uh, negotiation between the EU and the US to reach a political agreement a few months ago and now a process of validating the, uh, the draft uh, adequacy decision proposed by the Commission. Um, I think what's, what's important, and I'm sure my, my fellow panelists will, will dive a lot deeper uh, in, in those issues, is again, those two aspects of necessity and proportionality and uh, redress mechanism. Um, the necessity and proportionality uh, terms have uh, very specific legal meaning under, under EU law. Uh, they exist in, in US law, but are uh, uh, perhaps more known under terminology of reasonable. And so I guess the, the terminology aspect has always been a point of um, misunderstanding. I think that's how um, Bruno Giancarli qualified it yesterday. And again, it's not necessarily um, disagreement, but again, making sure that we have the same understanding of the, the terminology and their legal uh, meaning uh, was, was certainly a point of, of heavy uh, negotiations uh, during the privacy shield negotiations and, and now under the, the DPF. Um, so I think that's, that's a significant uh, new element that, um, that is being on the, on the table today. With regards to the redress mechanism, again, a lot of the criticisms was around uh, the level of, of independence um, of, the, of the previous redress mechanism. Uh, uh, the court says that it was uh, too close to executive branch uh, in the US government and hence not meeting the uh, uh, the essential equivalence test um, from, from a, an independence perspective in part. Um, so again, the redress mechanism as, uh, as proposed under the, the DPF now um, seems to tick a lot of the boxes um, addressing these concerns of, of independence. And again, I'll, I'll let my, uh, my colleagues here dive uh, a lot deeper into the, the discussion, but I think it's, it's quite um, significant that not only the terminology has gotten uh, has, has moved significantly uh, between what we saw in the, the privacy shield, what the court pointed to, and what we now see in the draft uh, DPF, uh, but also that there's been significant work done uh, on both sides, I think, to be looking for creative solutions, but also um, uh, being mindful of the constraints of uh, each jurisdiction's um, uh, legal structure. Um, so, Again, political agreement was, was reached uh, over a year ago now, and so uh, as you probably are well familiar with the um, EU approval process, um, the European Data Protection Board um, released an opinion on the, the draft um, adequacy decision. Um, by and large, I think the, the language from the board was, uh, was quite positive. Um, they uh, talked about uh, improvements uh, that were significant in the, um, in the draft <coughs> DPF. Uh, they pointed to the fact that redress mechanism introduced uh, more effective powers to remedy violation. Um, the, uh, the EDPB was quite um, um, uh, welcoming as well of the requirements of necessity and proportionality, but it also pointed to some of the um, concerns it still had with a few, a few areas, and it was uh, pointing to the need to further clarify certain aspects. Um, another important step in the approval process, um, though not formally part of the process, but certainly uh, informing the atmospherics of it, is the uh, European Parliament resolution, a non-binding resolution, but it, it is indicative of, of um, the, the Parliament's <coughs> uh, close attention to those issues, and, and indeed I think the Parliament has been 
uh, quite consistent in its read of uh, the EU-US adequacy talks throughout the years and throughout the different mechanisms. Um, so perhaps in a, again, in a fairly consistent uh, manner with its previous position, um, in its recent resolution, it really pointed to some of the, again, differing definitions of some of those critical terms of necessity and proportionality, um, pointing to uh, its uh, concerns with the Data Protection Review Court, uh, perhaps still lacking independence and general transparency. So there are still some, uh, some concerns raised on, on that front. Um, but the core of the, the approval process uh, now sits with the member states and, and the, uh, the, the vote that the member states will have to, to take. Um, we're here summer as the, the timeline, so we'll, I think we're all watching closely how that will uh, evolve. But so that's sort of where, where we are today. And I, I did want to spend a couple of minutes on uh, putting that into, into context again, wearing a, a, the, the IAPP hat and, and, and trying to convey some of the uh, remarks that we hear uh, more more regularly from from uh, many of our members. I think, uh, and it's been said in in the in the prior panel here, um, adequacy is one uh, option in a list of menu that the GDPR provides. Um, it's not it's not the only one, but it's an important one. Um, I think the the Commission has always been mindful to not create a, a hierarchy of transfer tools, um, but the what we've seen around decisions uh, of adequacy, and certainly the, the court jurisprudence does in inevitably play a role into into other mechanisms. And so I think there's a real question around, and you pointed to that when uh, um, talking about the meta decision earlier, which is there's a real question about how do we leverage adequacy to really also um, help uh, preserve other mechanisms or help develop other mechanisms. Some of them in the GDPR are, are yet to be um, fully put into practice from um, certification among among others. So there's a real uh, a real uh, strategic aspect to to adequacy there. Um, I think the other element I would add, which is more of a in the global context, um, the APP conducted some research uh, recently, and we find that. Uh, in about 74 jurisdictions across the world, um, there is some element of a, akin to a, an adequacy system um, in, in those 74 jurisdictions. So it means that the concept of adequacy has been, by and large, um, replicated, inspired, um, uh, is found in, another, in a lot of other places, and so that raises the question also of, um, of uh, interoperability or at least convergence of, of how to make, again, uh, adequacy a, a mechanism that, that can um, be leveraged also from a, from a global operations perspective. Um, and I will, I will conclude with a, a third point, which is uh, maybe a more pragmatic one. Um, I think we there's no doubt that the, at a political level, an, an agreement on uh, EU-US data transfers has a lot of a lot of weight. It sends a strong signal. It's also uh, very important uh, from a, an economic standpoint, from a geostrategic <coughs> standpoint. Um, but I think there's also a, a pragmatic question to be asked, um, again, uh, illustrated by this week's decision on the, the volatility of the environment in which uh, organizations operate today. Um, and so uh, I think the, the, the question of how much buy-in we will see from the community into uh, the adequacy mechanism is, is one as well. Um, how will uh, uh, fallouts from the Irish decision earlier this week uh, will materialize into some of the data sovereignty or localization trends that we see um, in, in Europe, but also that might inform similar trends we see in other, in other jurisdictions. So I think the, the, the debate is, is maybe no longer even on, on whether the EU-US adequacy will be a durable mechanism, but uh, maybe broadening it to whether there will be any durable mechanism given what we've seen uh, earlier this week. And that's um, quite significant for organizations, certainly, that need to transfer data daily, uh, but I see it as equally significant for, for consumers um, alike. And so I think as we as we debate the, the merits of the EO, uh, I think we need to be very clear-minded about the, the broader reality that, that um, transatlantic data transfers, but data transfers more generally um, have uh, operated in today. And with that, I'll, I'll stop here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, I have to say that it has <coughs> been a very interesting presentation. She has pointed out the concerns of the EDPB and of the European Parliament 
on the uh, draft adequacy decision of the European Commission, but also she has referred to the merits of the EO, the European order of the President Biden, and the need to find um, um, to find a solution and, and um, um, a, a, a good framework for for uh, for uh, maintaining, for keeping uh, uh, keeping on with the the flow of the of the data be between the EU and the US. In the second place, we, we are going to listen to um, uh, Georgios Stavonopoulos, who is a um, member of the South EU Google Data Governance Chair, and it is a professor on IT law in an university of in the University of, of Athens. Uh, I give the floor to him, but n first of all, I I would like. I, I, I would like to, to remember that, or to, to say that uh, he's going to, to address the problem of the essential equivalence of the, the system uh, uh, implemented by the DPF and, uh, and, and the necessity and proportionality um, uh, requirements and its significance. Thank you, Georges. Thank you. Is it okay? Am I listening? Yes. And can I have the control, please? Okay. Uh, well, everybody is talking about uh, the meta decision, of course. Uh, Vicente is going to talk uh, thoroughly about that later on. Uh, but before we move into that, let's see where we stand in terms of the executive order. We have, uh, we have had a lot of expectations last year uh, we also had a session in, uh, for our chair in Madrid for that particular matter. Uh, but we have significant changes. Well, uh, well, we have the input from the European Parliament and from the European uh, Data Protection Board. Uh, let's see where do we stand. And let's see, after all, if we can, I mean, the main question is whether we can have a viable framework between EU and US. Of course, uh, the whole story is about economy, it's about uh, money. Uh, every, nobody really talks about the 7 trillion uh, US-EU uh, economic relationship uh, which lies uh, underneath. Uh, so we have to take that into mind and we have to take also uh, into consideration who is the producer of services, who is the consumer of services. Uh, anyway, if we move into the details of the executive order, uh, you know, all these orders and uh, legal texts, they start, they start with a very, you know, optimistic preamble to strengthen the privacy and civil liberties, uh, introducing safeguards governing U.S. signals intelligence activities. Okay, that's good, but uh, what do they want to do? They want, first of all, to define a national strategy for U.S., and that is very significant for us because under the terms of the GDPR, we have to define the purpose. What is the purpose in the United States? What is the purpose in uh, the European Union? For example, terrorism. How do we consider terrorism? How do they consider terrorism? Uh, anyway, uh, what is happening is that we are trying to export notions of our common legal tradition, European tradition. We are trying to export them to the United States. Like, a necessary, a necessary and proportionate test in line with Article 52 of the Chapter of Fundamental Rights. Uh, how do the Americans understand these notions? We're going to see that uh, later on. Uh, the, practical, the practical issue that is that uh, in terms of the executive order, we have two uh, mechanisms. We have two, two tier redress mechanism. We have the civil liberties protection officer uh, who is investigating any issues. And then we have the Data Protection uh, Review Court. Uh, we are going to see that it's not actually a court, but anyway, it's the second, uh, the second stage of appeals for that one. Are we there yet? Uh, are we there yet? No, we are not there yet because we need an adequacy decision from the European Commission. This adequacy de decision came out on the 13th of December 2022 but it's now under consideration both from the European Data Protection Board and the European Parliament, as we are going to see. So, uh, practical concerns. I'm only, uh, I'm always, uh, you know, a bit hesitant because 
uh, myself being also, apart from being an academic, I'm a practicing lawyer, and I've seen the way clients interact with all these issues. Uh, we had an initial thought, that uh, an initial input, that the European Commission thought that the court will not strike down the agreement again. Uh, we are waiting to see what's going to happen because in the meantime we have the meta decision, we have declarations from Maximilian Srems, uh, but let's come to the practical issues. Uh, who is the exporter? We have all these big platforms, the so-called the GAFAM and so on. Uh, who is the exporter? Who is the controller and who is the uh, processor of information? That's very critical because uh, if we define the controller and the processor, then we know how to uh, assign liabilities. Uh, what mechanism is going to work until we have this adequacy decision? Because we have, have the adequacy decision, but it, it's not fully enforced. Uh, we are waiting for um, the, from the Americans to, 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 to state that the European citizens are under the uh, qualified citizens uh, notion. Uh, uh, in the meantime, uh, we have to apply Articles 40, 40, 45, and 46 of the of the GDPR, uh, which lies a lot on standard contractual clauses. But in the meantime, we have the meta decision. Vicenzo is going to talk about that uh, later on. So, bottom line, from the practical point of view, we are in a standstill. I'm not quite sure how I would be in a position to advise my clients as of what they have to do. Uh, moving on, uh, if we move to the, to the legal issues, uh, I'm a bit hesitant because I said that we are, we are trying to export ideas from our common legal civilization, if you want. Uh, but how do United States agencies understand proportionality. If we talk about proportionality in Europe, we have to go to a long case law of the uh, European Court of Justice, maybe also from the European Court of Human Rights, to understand what proportionality is. That's point number one. Uh, then we have a number of issues because uh, we still need uh, changes in American statutory law uh, to ensure that they, uh, they have put in place uh, definitions for uh, what is necessary and proportional. Uh, the, 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 civil liber the civil liberties officer, it's not, he, is not, he or she is not really independent, and the court is not really court. Uh, so where do we stand? I mean, it is an executive body which is going to judge about appeals, but not the idea of a court that we have here, and certainly not. If you go, to the, if you go through the SREMS 2 decision, you will see that you, we need a proper court, you know, with a judge, an independent judge, and so on. How do these things comply with, with what happens, with what is prescribed in the executive order? Uh, will all these organizations, the American organizations, meet their obligations? Uh, and bottom line, for that one, also, I, I, I'm, all, uh, I'm trying to be, uh, you know, in a way practical. Uh, what kind, nobody discusses the kind of data that are being transferred from uh, Europe to United States. Well, if this is serious data, like what we used to call sensitive or special categories of data and so on and so on, then we cannot have that regulated with soft law, okay? If it is not serious data, then why do we need to regulate? Why do we have always to prohibit? Uh, I'm quite skeptical about that. Uh, why? Because the idea, ever since the GDPR, the idea that we have in Europe about regulating things is that we should see uh, the, the, the level of danger. If you look into also into the Artificial Intelligence Act, there is always an estimation uh, of the levels of danger. Uh, how 
are we going to have this, um, how, who is going to do this uh, assessment uh, for that purpose? Uh, many questions. I was supposed to give answers here today, but uh, yeah, uh, th all these things are in my mind. A in the meantime, we have the, briefly, the opinion from the European uh, Data Protection Board, opinion five of 2023. Uh, the, the board has recognized substantial improvement, improvements in the whole system, but requests a lot of clarifications, refers again to the independence of the American authorities, uh, no clear and strict uh, data retention rules, uh, no definition about the temporary bulk collection, all these things that we are discussing about cl cloud uh, storage and so on. Uh, and no legally binding obligation to analyze third countries. If you want, you can, you can go through the opinion to see all these uh, hesitations of the European Data Protection Board. And on top of that, we have the hesitations from the European Parliament. Uh, again, here uh, we have uh, six major uh, findings. Uh, the executive order does not apply to the, does not apply to the to the American Cloud Act and to the American Patriot Act. Uh, Non-US citizens, we are still waiting for the qualification. Actually, we have been discussing that before uh, the start of our panel. We, it's a tug of, of war between EU and US. Uh, the, the EU is not giving the adequacy decision. The US are not giving the status of uh, qualified citizen. Let's see what's going to, to happen. Uh, and also, the decisions of the of these two uh, redress mechanisms, uh, the, the officer and the court, they are not available, they are not classified, uh, and they are not made public. Uh, so the bottom line from the side of the European Parliament is this is not, the executive order is not a clear piece of legislation, uh, precise and foreseeable in its application. All these three terms, are essential elements in our European procedures, either in Luxembourg or in Strasbourg, in the bo both courts. Uh, yeah, uh, I think that's all. No, uh, my final word. Uh, what are we expecting from this whole situation? Uh, I think uh, everybody's talking about Europe being a very good exporter of <laughs> legislation. I'm with that but we can not only be exporters of prohibitions, uh, because in that, sense, uh, in that sense, compliance is becoming a mission impossible, okay? And of course, it may take only two letters to make mission impossible possible, uh, but in the meantime, this seems to be uh, very difficult. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, George. Very insightful presentation, insightful ideas, analysis. Uh, it's time for our third panelist. It's uh, Malagrasa Cantomonis. Uh, she's also a member of the South EU Google uh, Data Governance uh, Chair, but also she's a professor at the, uh, the School of Law of the Nova University in Lisbon. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm just waiting for my presentation to show on the screen. But I will briefly uh, bring to you, I will explain to you the redress mechanism in the executive order, and then I will give you, I will also raise more questions than provide you answers. Uh, although I think that some of the answers um, are implicit in the questions that I will, I will suggest. So let's, let's start by framing what is the redress problem. So if, if you recall from uh, uh, Schrems 1 and, and 2, the main issue that the court raised was related to Article 47 of the European Charter of, of Fundamental Rights. And uh, the main issue that the court raised was related to the fact that there was no, uh, there was no possibility of uh, 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 an individual to pursue a legal remedy according to the standard that we have uh, in Article 47. And what is that standard? What does Article 47 requires uh, for the US to, to have in order to ensure that any, any individual has <coughs> access to a redress mechanism? So the first thing is that 
it needs to have access to an effective remedy before a tribunal, a tribunal that is impartial, independent, and previously established by law. The second uh, criteria is that the individuals should have a fair and public hearing within reasonable time. And then the third requirement is that uh, the same individuals should have uh, advice, defense, and representation in, in a tribunal with those, those characteristics. And the key question that I would like to discuss with you is if the new redress mechanism in the executive order is essentially equivalent to, to this standard of uh, Article 47. And the, the main thing for those of you who don't know uh, the, the mechanics of the redress mechanism is that it has a two layer, as George has al already mentioned. The first layer has these five uh, key steps that you can see in the slide. So individuals from a qualified state, uh, they can fill a complaint in a public authority in that state. Then they send the complaint to the Civil Liberties Protection Officer, the CLPO, um, which is someone in the office of the Director of National Intelligence in, in the US. And then this first uh, official should assess whether there was a covered uh, violation, which is basically a violation of indiv individual privacy and uh, civil liberties. And then if the CLPO concludes that there was a violation, he or she should establish an appropriate remedy, so should suggest a remedy, and inform uh, the Assistant Attorney General for National Security. security. <coughs> After, uh, after this, 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 this stage, after this assessment, the CLPO provides a standardized answer, uh, a scripted response to the individual, which basically says that the review of your complaint either did not identify any violation uh, or the CLPO uh, of the Director of National Intelligence issued a uh, determining requiring appropriate remediation. So he, he, he only sends the individual, the complainant, this, this, this scripted response. Then there's another layer of, of this mechanism, which is a layer that is um, developed in the court, which George has mentioned that it's not really a court, but it's called the Data Protection Review Court. And this court has the main task, task to review um, the decision uh, of the CLPO. And basically, uh, the court uh, is, the mandate of the court is only to review uh, the determination that was made by the CLPO um, with respect to whether there was uh, a violation or not, and also to assess the remediation that was proposed by the CLPO. If the court finds uh, a covered violation, so if the court agrees with the assessment that was done by the CLPO, <coughs> uh, the executive order provides that the intelligence community shall comply uh, with the court, the, the court solution and, and remediation. And then after this assessment, after reviewing uh, the CLPO's uh, decision, the court also informs uh, the complaint of it also provides him or her uh, a scripted response which says that the review either did not identify any covered violations or the Data Protection Review Court issued a determination regarding appropriate remediation. This is the text that an individual will receive upon uh, issuing, upon uh, um, presenting a complaint in, a, uh, 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 um, in an authority. And what are the main problems uh, that I, I see uh, in, in this process? And that if, if we recall uh, the three, let me see if I can see the slide, if we recall the three uh, criteria that are in Article 47. And those problems are related to the fact that Article 47 demands an effective remedy and fairness, first. Second, it demands an impartial and independent court. And third, it also says that the court should be previously established by law. And now I, I will dig a bit in each of those, of those elements. So regarding the first, effective remedy and fairness. There is a remedy now. We have a remedy and we have a, a remedy with two layers, as I just explained. Uh, so contrary to what happened in the, privacy sh in the privacy shield, if you recall, there was this ombudsperson. Now we have uh, two levels, we have the CLPO and we have the Data Protection Review Court. But the questions that I raise are the following. Can a remedy that needs to be effective, that needs to be fair, uh, 
can the court consider a remedy to be effective and fair if the complainant only receives a standard uh, answer, as I just explained to you? And if we go and study previous decisions from the court regarding security measures in the European Union, for example, uh, those mentioned in the slide, the CADI 2 case and the Big Brother Watch judgment, the court was very uh, concise when it demanded to provide at least more information to the complainant regarding, for example, the kind of evidence that was using to support uh, the, the measure that was affecting his or her fundamental rights. So this regards uh, the effectiveness and fairness of the solution. The second point is, as George has already mentioned, the problem of independence and impartiality. So the first, la the first layer, the CLPO, is an officer under the Director of National Intelligence. So it's not independent, it, it cannot be impartial. And the European Data Protection Board says this very, very clearly. Regarding the Data Protection Review Court, there is a, a, a a positive point in the executive order, which is the fact that the judges that compose this court are appointed by the Attorney General according to uh, reliable criteria that are the same criteria that are used to, cho to choose these judges are those criteria that are used to choose federal judges in the US, for example. So the criteria are solid, are strong. And I think that this is positive. And they can serve four terms. So there's a limitation on the number of terms that they can serve. But the questions that I raise regarding this, this issue is that the CLPO, as I told you, is not independent. Uh, but uh, the, the question that I, I still am not 100% certain is uh, the removal of judges. Because uh, the, the executive order says uh, that they cannot be removed from the attorney general, but maybe the US president can have a power to remove them. So this is quite unclear to me, and the executive order should be more clear on, on this topic. Lastly, uh, the Article 47 also demands that the court should be previously established by law. And this is a, a criteria that the court in Trends 1 and 2 never, never had an opinion about. So I'm quite curious to see how the court, if the court, if we, we, we come to that stage, if the court will be very, very uh, demanding on this specific criteria. Uh, the European Data Protection Board quotes two decisions from the Court of Justice that explain that this criteria is intended to ensure that the organization of the judicial system does not depend on the discretion of the executive, but that it is regulated by law emanating from the legislature. Uh, so the question, as I already told you, is that in TRAMS 1 and in TRAMS 2, the Court of Justice did not have a say on this specific criteria. So I'm very curious to see if the solution that we have in the redress mechanism um, is or is not considered by the court as essentially equivalent to what Article 47 of, 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 the, of, the, of the Charter of Fundamental Rights demands. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria Gasha, uh, for this uh, interesting presentation focused on human rights. Uh, and we have heard uh, from you that it is not only important, Article 7 and Article 8, eh, and its necessity and, and proportionality requirements, but also, but also uh, um, a fair hearing uh, following Article 47. It's very interesting. Uh, uh, I, would, I, would, uh, I would stress the necessity of, trans of, transpa of transparency, pro probably uh, afterwards in the, in the in the dialogue, I have opportunity to ask you about it. Thank you. And finally, we have the f our fourth panelist, who is Professor Zeno Zenkovic, who is joining us from Rome online. And uh, he's also um, a member of the, of the board of the Google, uh, EU, South EU Google Data Governance Chair, but also professor of comparative, of comparative law in, in Roma Dre, in, in, in this beautiful city as Roma. And the floor is yours, Vincenzo, going for 15 minutes, more or less. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So thanks to our chair, Professor Fernandez uh, Portrete. Uh, thanks to the other panelists, uh, Dr. Isabella Rocha and uh, uh, my dear friends, uh, Professor Cantomonis and Professor Yanopoulos. I do apologize for not being there in presence, but I have at the same time, these same days, I have the conference of my 
Italian Association of Comparative Law, of which I've been chairman for many years. And so <clears throat> I could not miss uh, uh, this, uh, um, uh, this event. Um, I have some slides. I don't know um, who is to share the slides. Is it me who should share them? Maybe it's me. Let's see if it's I can share them. Um, Okay, I hope, um, let's make them, just let me see if I can make them slightly. I'm just, would like just to know if the, if the slides can be seen, if you can tell me, because I'm not, a, I'm always have doubts if the slides can be seen. Can can someone, can the chair, can Professor Hernandez just tell me if they are visible or I yes, should make it, them? It is, it is perfectly visible. Okay. Then as you see, the title is very ominous. It just says that the, I'm, I will analyze a decision which was delivered, uh, which was published on Monday by the Irish Data Protection Commission on the case of MIT. Uh, platforms island and I just call it the best snail for transatlantic data transfer. This is the bottom line. Uh, just to point out that it is, uh, um, I mean, whatever we we have sought, we think uh, that may happen, uh, we read this decision and this is just the end of any possibility of transfer from, the, from Europe to the U.S. Um, what is the, let's see if I can, ah, yes, now this decision uh, delivered, uh, well, it's dated May 12, but it was published on, on Monday, the, written by Commissioner Helen Dixon. It is 216 pages. It is very lengthy and it's worthwhile reading because we go through a whole lot of uh, various issues. Uh, and the inquiry starts, please let me notice this. And, some of the speakers already mentioned this issue. We started 10 years ago, June 2013. Complainant, as usual, Maximilian Schrems. And what has happened in these 10 years, we have the Schrems 1 decision, Schrems 2 decision, the GDPR, so, and uh, uh, obviously the various, the two agreements with the US would have been just been. Uh, uh, trashed by the uh, European Court of Justice, both the um, safe harbor agreement and the privacy, privacy shield agreement. So just to give you what happened in these 10 years, volatility, well, this is more than volatility. This is really, I mean, one doesn't know where to stand. And if I, if you have uh, uh, a company that has to do business, this obviously you cannot do business on this on these basis. Now let's go to the substance. Uh, the, this is the analysis that uh, Irish Data Protection Commissioner gives of the executive order, executive order on enhancing safeguards for United States signal intelligence activities. And the uh, same date we have this, uh, um, the, uh, the Attorney General which establishes a data protection review court um, Professor Cantomonis has uh, presented it. Now, but is this executive order executive? This is the first interesting point. It is, and the Data Protection Commission, Irish Data Protection Commissioner says, no, it is not executive. It is an executive order, but it is not executive. Because um, uh, complaints will be received and reviewed. I'm just quoting from the decision uh, by the Irish decision reviewed under the new redress mechanism introduced by executive order and the regulation only where they originated in a designated qualifying state. So they must come from a qualifying state. So that's the first point. Second point, is the EU a qualifying state? Mm, uh, what is necessary? There's a decision by the US Attorney General in consultation with the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Commerce, and most important, Director of 
national intelligence. Professor Cantamonis has pointed out. I mean, this is for the U.S. It is quite. I mean, we Europeans have a rather sort of a, a easygoing attitude toward these issues. That when you are a superpower, number one is intelligence. So uh, and so, this is why the civil liberties the protection officer is under the uh, in the office of the national intelligence. And so, um, and so they, they must establish that the uh, conditions uh, are satisfied by the European Union. And so the EU has not been has not been designated as a qualifying state, and therefore the redress mechanism set out by the USA um, uh, are not available for EU citizens. And even if the EU were designated as a qualifying state, the redress mechanism would not be compliant with articles 41, 45, and following 45, 46, and 47 of the GDPR. So whatever our, um, we can analyze, and as long as we love analyzing text, but this is what the Irish Data Commissioner says, and I have the vague impression that this decision is not come out of the blue, but has is somehow the result of a certain amount of uh, internal discussions within the uh, European Data Protection Board and the European Data Protection Supervisor. So how does the, uh, what does the, what are the challenges of the, of the Irish DTC? The EU creates an entitlement only to access the Civil Liberties Protection Officer and to have its decisions reviewed by Data Protection Review Court, but, quote, it is not intended to and does not create any other entitlement, right, or benefit, substantive or procedural, enforceable at law or in equity by any party against the United States, its departments, agencies, or entities, its offices. This comes from obviously the the the, um, uh, the decision by the executive order and the uh, uh, regulation set out by the attorney general. So this is the. The Irish DPC says, what is this? What are we talking about? Uh, and then, uh, furthermore, there is no deadline to establish if a country is a qualified state. So we are waiting and we, sort of, we will wait uh, uh, to decide if we are, if the European Union is or is not a qualified state. There have been uh, no guidelines concerning the role of the US intelligence. The judges have not been yet appointed. And um, uh, executive order does not apply retrospectively to data transfers before October 2022. So all these elements, uh, uh, which are very clearly set out in the opinion of the uh, Irish DTC, are just say, well, the, the transfer to the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, it was not possible before; it is not possible now. Um, so, uh, conclusively, uh, what does the, the Irish DPC say? Uh, the um, executive order and redress mechanism are not compliant, nor with Article 8, um, Paragraph 3 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which requires that uh, data protection should be entrusted upon independent authority. and. Secondly, uh, the, with Article 45, Paragraph 2 of the GDPR, in order to establish a, if a third country has an adequate level of protection, it is necessary to verify the existence and effective functioning of one or more independent supervisory authorities in the third country or to which an international organization is subject with responsibility for ensuring and enforcing compliance with the data protection rules, including adequate enforcement files for assisting advising data subjects in exercising their rights and for cooperation with the supervisory authorities of the member states. And we've seen in the Schrems 2 decision, which comes after the GDPR, although it was applying uh, previous uh, provisions, but anyhow, this kind of interpretation is very strict and the Court of Justice is, uh, um, we, I, I mean, I, I think that the uh, there's no reason to be optimistic. It, we know how the Court of Justice has reasoned. We know very well what it has said, and so the, the, I don't see any much chances of the executive order uh, being, or rather, the, the act by which 
the decision by which the, uh, the European Union says that there's an adequate level of protection in the U.S. owing to the um, executive order and to the Attorney General regulations, um, I don't think that this will stand stand any chance in front of the Court of Justice. So where do we, um, what, what is this? This has already been mentioned by other, other speakers. Uh, uh, it's uh, Professor Yanopoulos said it's tug of war. I just say tug of war, I think it's a tit for tat. Uh, so we start saying, we Europeans start saying this extraterritorial um, application of GDPR Article 3, that the US response was the Cloud Act saying, that uh, U.S. orders apply to uh, American uh, companies wherever they're established. This is obviously a response to the uh, Southern District of New York decision on Microsoft Island. And so this cloud act says, well, wherever you are, you must give us the data. So then we uh, respond with the Data Governance Act and with the Data Act, and we deny enforcement of decisions of third countries if there is not an agreement with that country. And then, so we do not yet recognize that the U.S. have an adequate level of protection and the U.S. does not designate the EU as a qualifying state. So this is the situation, it's a tit for tat situation, which, according to me, will bring to nothing. It just brings us, bogs us down. Uh, result. So there's a great deal of lip service. Uh, Professor Yanopoulos said, you know, these great speeches, a great preamble saying very, uh, uh, very broad and optimistic uh, views. Uh, they say, we all say there should be free flow of data. The only result of this situation is that of data localization. Data may be collected, processed, and uh, uh, and used only in the country or the region where it is collected. And this is very realistic, the situation uh, which has, uh, uh, the, the, what has been adopted by the People's Republic of China with their um, Cybersecurity Act. They said the data does not go out. It's the data, Chinese data collected in China remains here and you do not export. So the whole idea is that data, all data, not only personal data, are strategic resource and cannot be exported to third countries. Um, someone was saying, what is, uh, Professor Yanopoulos said, what is serious data and what is not serious? From a, from a strategic, but not, I wouldn't say from an intelligence point of view, but from a strategic point of view, from an economic point of view, uh, all data is relevant, even data on how much, what is the kind of toothpaste I use, or rather we all use in the morning, not me, but the, the aggregate uh, information on what toothpaste we use is not has no intelligence uh, relevance, but it does have uh, uh, economic uh, value. So this is my very uh, realistic approach, which I trust. Uh, I'm just provoking, and I hope they will be. Uh, this is just uh, I don't want to. I don't have a crystal ball in front of me, but. It seems to me rather um, sort of uh, plausible. Uh, last the point I want to just to make, and I would like to go back to um, Professor Yanopoulos' first slide when he says it's um, seven, uh, seven trillion um, exchange, transatlantic exchange. I think, sorry very much, one has to put things, say things squarely. Is the European Union a hostage of Mr. Schrem? This is the point. I mean, if, if the whole system is somehow, they, they, our foreign policy depends on Mr. Schrems, well, they might as well designate him as a sort of a high commissioner for foreign policy. I mean, it really makes absolutely no sense, this exaltation of, you know, fundamental rights, and so data protection, Uber Alice, and so we, we are not going to have any trade agreement with the U.S. because a trade, uh, uh, trade agreement with the U.S. means that they must be able to export services and informational services to us, and we must, we in exchange, we uh, export our goods. Second point, uh, should international policy 
which is not only uh, international, uh, has to do with intelligence, but has to do with trade, being trusted, is the final decider, the final person who must, the, the entity that decides is the court of justice. I, I have some, some reservations about this, and I think it is not good for the European Union. It is a Europe, foreign policy is a, a political issue, and member states must take the responsibility within the council to take certain decisions of uh, relationships with other parts of the world. If all these decisions are subject to judicial review, well, we're not going to do it. It doesn't work out. You don't do, sort of you don't do foreign policy on on sort of on uh, petty foggish attitude on on norms and start in, interpreting norms. Saying you can do this and you cannot do that. I don't think foreign policy. Is, uh, it's in the interest of the European Union. Uh, I'm a lawyer, I'm an academic lawyer, I'm a practicing lawyer, but I don't think uh, foreign policy should be governed by uh, commas, paragraphs, and uh, sub-paragraphs, and sub-primary law, and whatever not, uh, something different. So this is a very uh, realistic, realpolitik approach, but I think this should be, it's deserved to be expressed, and this is my person, very, very personal view. Uh, which I, obviously for which I and only I am responsible. Thanks a lot for having me uh, participate, also uh, distance from uh, to this very interesting panel. Thank you very much, Professor Senosenkovic. Uh, uh, for me, it is clear from your presentation that nowadays current approach, European approach, legal European approach is incompatible with, with a DPF and the only solution it seems to, to, uh, to consider uh, this flow of data not as a, as a legal one but a, a, as a political one, as a foreign policy issue. Uh, thank, thanks a lot and uh, now we have we have left uh, 15 minutes, 20 minutes uh, probably, to question answers time. So uh, the floor is yours. If you want, you can tell your name if you want. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for the, the panel and the presentation. It was very, very, very interesting. So my name is Marcelo Corrales. I am an associate professor and associate director of the Civil Center at the University of Copenhagen. So I have one question. Is this all, is, it seems to me that um, it is very, we still have to wait and see, right? So the practical question is, can we still use the standard contractual clauses and how exactly? If you had to advise your client to transfer data what are the steps that you need to take into account? Thank you very much. Who going to answer? It, I think the, the, the question is for... For everybody, mm -hmm. who wants to answer? Uh, I, would, I would advise my client to go ahead with uh, standard contractual clauses, but we have to read carefully the meta decision. Uh, if you read it, I mean, it's 216 pages, I think, long. Uh, if you read it briefly now, I, I didn't have the chance to read it through the details. The idea I got was that um, it strikes down standard con contractual clauses. So we have to re-engineer standard contractual clauses according to what the decision says. But then we end up uh, uh, with something which is, I would say, uh, what is the wording for w w w w in in co in computer language? We have this um, uh, idea of a snake uh, biting the tail of the snake. Mm -hmm. So, I think that's where we are right now, uh, because no matter how good standard contractual clauses we build, we are always under the threat that, according to sub some some sub paragraph somewhere, uh, this will be striking down. Uh, so I, I mean I don't know how how helpful I was, but I think we are on a very volatile situation right now. Uh, 
because most clients, they are using standard contractual clauses, but at the moment we have to re-engineer this whole uh, mechanism. Uh, I don't know if I was helpful. I don't know if the other colleagues have something to add. I just want to add. Uh, I think that the first thing is to understand who is the controller and who is the processor and the chain of data processing, the data life cycle. And then the second thing um, is to, and to, if you are the data controller, if the client is the data controller, you need to ensure that you have as much as evidence and information, whether it's transparency reports, uh, 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 certifications, whatever, that can defend your client uh, if it wants to use uh, standard contractual clauses. Um, the, the main problem that I see nowadays is that at least in Portugal, and I'm speaking from my experience, big players are not obviously able to be open to negotiations. And sometimes they want to impose uh, a qualification, uh, whether it's processing or, or data controller, which can be challenging. And the second thing, uh, they are not able to provide you the evidence that you need. This is the practice in Portugal. You can do a risk assessment, you can, you can try to fill a checklist, uh, but in the end, in Portugal, there was a decision uh, from uh, a Portuguese uh, a public entity that decided to, to promote a census, um, and they used uh, a provider, a US provider. And the main two issues that the DPA, it, this is post trends too, the main two issues that the DPA uh, pointed was the first one, there was no, I mean, there was the contract, but the contract was insufficient because it, they didn't, while they were negotiating the contract, they did not require, they did not demand enough evidence. And the second was that it was not performing a data, pr a data protection impact assessment, not a data transfer impact assessment, a data protection impact assessment. And these were the two main points that, that, that so if you want to try to comply, you need to have a contract and you need to have a data protection impact assessment in Portugal. But, but this is also in uncertain in, in the future <laughs> if this is enough, if it's not enough. Just add a couple of things. So I'm not a lawyer, so I wouldn't dare give legal advice. Um, I, as I as I hear those comments, I, I I concur. I think there's three fundamentals to me to go back to basics of the GDPR. <coughs> One is that in the GDPR, the title says free data flows, and so we should not lose sight of that. Um, two other things that the GDPR really uh, um, empowers are the level of accountability, and indeed, I think there is a lot of value in doing the homework and showing um, what, what your organization does, what, whether you're the importer or exporter as well, sort of the, the responsibilities and, and expectations will be slightly different. And the other element, which is also quite fundamental, and that the meta decisions of challenges to some, to some extent is the risk-based approach as well. And this concept of do we look at purely the theory of data transfers or do we look also at the practice? And I don't know that the court will sort of sway towards looking more at the effective practice of the reality of data transfers, but I think it's probably helpful as an organization to still sort of rely on that in the context of your of, uh, of the accountability. If I mean, there are a number of statistics and studies out there that uh, quantify the number of government access requests that the US has, um, has done. A lot of companies have transparency reports. Some numbers are, um, so some, some are bracketed, so, uh, or brackets of number rather, so they're not necessarily um, extremely precise, but they show, um, again, a sense of reality versus the theory of what um, the debate ten tends to be. So I think so if building on, on those elements, again, um, those may be more theoretical than, than a practical answer to, to your very pragmatic question, but I think sort of going back to those three basics of, the GDPR was also meant to facilitate data transfers, data flows, um, and not losing sight of risk-based approach and accountability, to my mind, is, is really key. Only, only one word from, on, on, my, on my behalf. Uh, I think that uh, I just data protection decision, data, data protection commission decision, uh, has singled out uh, meta when there are many companies which are doing the same. The problem here is not up to the company, the private company, because the problem re relies on the government access to data. And there's no option for 
for, for adapting with supplementary measures uh, and standard, standard contractor clauses in that situation. All, that com all those companies are in the same situation. Now, only Meta has been, has suffered from an inquiry, but anyone can be the object of an inquiry, and all of them are in the same situation. Unfortunately, I think that according to Screm's DOS resolution, all of them are in the same situation because it is not possible for them to give supplementary safeguards uh, to overcome the, 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 uh, the drawbacks of the US legal system. So uh, that's why I uh, told you at the beginning that I think that we need to a new system, a new, a new system which um, uh, provide us with certainty because now we have no certainty or, or if you want we have certainty but in the sense that everyone uh, could suffer from an inquiry and could suffer from a fine any time. Hello, this is the mic. Hi, uh, I'm Peter Swire. I'm a professor of law in the United States at Georgia Tech. And um, thank you for the very expert and informed commentary, including all the details of US law you've had to suffer through. So uh, <laughs> I, I have sympathy having tried to learn European law over the years. Um, my my uh, question is, goes to something we're going to be discussing in the next panel in this room, which is essential equivalence, in particular, there are certain US constitutional doctrines that were important in shaping how the data privacy framework was established. And so I'm curious your reaction. If it turns out you view there are limits under US constitutional law, how you would think about essential equivalence applying then? Is it just that European law must prevail or is there some different analysis if there's US constitutional law differences that dictate how the framework was created? I think on the speaker on the on the at remote, we can't hear. We can hear you. We cannot hear. Are you muted? Uh, can you hear me yes, now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, if I may just reply, as a European lawyer brought up in the U.S., it's uh, trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. Um, the differences between the uh, U.S. and European, uh, including the European, I mean also the British uh, constitutional systems are so uh, different that uh, um, uh, it is uh, rather rather difficult to have this kind of equivalency. Uh, the point is that uh, one should try to under, I mean, what has been built over these last years is if I, and I I trust our um, American colleague immediately understands us, is somehow some sort of European Union exceptionalism. And so the European Union is exceptional, the mm, fundamental rights are protected in the European Union like in no other part of the world, and so on and so forth. So unless you accept that there are differences in the Western legal tradition, not, I mean, we're not talking of, you know, relationships between European Union and China or India, we're talking of relationships between two uh, parts of the world that are, they are, they must be uh, kept together. And you don't, you don't, there isn't the principle of mutual recognition. We do not agree with as Europeans with many things that go on in the uh, things that go, I mean, from a legal point of view, that go on in the US, we don't find uh, certain solutions appropriate in the Americans don't find certain solutions appropriate in Europe, but all we apply mutual recognition of uh, general uh, overall um, mutual recognition or there's never going to be understanding. It's just going to be, you know, Europeans say, oh, but we are the best. We are very uh, much ahead of you and you don't, you Americans don't protect uh, 
fundamental rights and the U.S. says, sorry very much, we are uh, your atomic shield. We are protecting not only you, but the rest of the world. And we have a, a responsibility, which is not your responsibility. You don't take no responsibility for world order. We do, and we are protecting you. So uh, let us do our job. So, I mean, if there's no mutual trust and mutual recognition, we're not going to go anywhere. Uh, we have time for a last question, please. Can I just add a quick comment? Uh, while, excuse me. Uh, no, phone. sorry. Well, Sebastian, sorry. Just I want to add a quick comment. And again, I'm a very down to earth person, so I'm not going to comment on the constitutional level. But I think what what we observe, though, is aside from all those sort of very at times conflictual, lightly frictious uh, discussions, that we do see some um, convergence on a lot of so sort of very perhaps narrow but significant aspects. And you mentioned the Cloud Act earlier. I think it's interesting to know that in the EU, we now have the e-evidence uh, regulation as well. Sort of, there is conversions done at, at sort of different levels as well. And maybe that can help overcome also some of the sort of constitutional um, limitations that we find ourselves in on, on both sides. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, dear professors, for your um, presentations and for your concerns and for your questions and for your answers as well. But I have a kind of more provocative uh, question here. How sure or unsure are you that the um, next um, DPF will withstand the legal challenge in front of the in front of the court? Right, because we heard the ADPB, we heard the European Parliament concerns, we heard your concerns. So I'm very curious your personal stand on. How sure or unsure you will be? I asked the same question yesterday in in, in the panel with Bruno Gencarel and, and with uh, with other experts, but I didn't get like um, an, an answer. And also Commissioner Didier Reinders, he was positive that uh, you know the the DPF will withstand in front of the court. But I'm curious on what's your take on that. Thanks a lot. My answer is very straightforward. I have no idea. I'm not sure. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, well, I have an idea, uh, which is that from previous decisions we have seen, and that's something which I'm saying in my speeches, that uh, in many cases uh, the court has come out with something which is so vague that even Pythia from the uh, Oratory of Delphi <laughs> would have felt jealous about that saying. Uh, in most cases, uh, well, and I, well, I haven't done any, you know, proper research on that. But the, the, the court is throwing the ball to the national courts to decide according to their uh, local, cultural, uh, ethical traditions, if you want. Uh, but it doesn't take a position, a clear position. Uh, if we come into that now again. Like Maria Grata said, I don't know. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we have arrived to the to the end. Uh, I have to uh, to say that um, it has been for me uh, a great experience to be here with all of you, and I I hope to see you next uh, year here again. Thank you.